This video will take us through the process of accessing a workflow function as a RESTful web service. In another video, we used a workflow function to create a workflow action. The workflow that we used was this workflow, add two numbers. So we'll take this already defined workflow and continue and extend its use as a workflow function to be accessed as a web service. In this case, I have add two numbers and it has been deployed and it is now ready to be used as a function. Just before we go into the screen, let's see what this workflow does. We have a start step with a few variables, number A, number B, and result. And I happen to know that this workflow is going to take A and B, add them together, and return the result. And it does that through this math action where we are putting in the number A, number B, adding and storing the result in the variable, in this case, actually called result. Now that I have this workflow, I can call it as a function. And the way that I do that is to go to Manage Workflow Functions. And I will see that I had already defined a function for add two numbers. And let's look at its properties. It has a name or path. And in this case, the path is interesting because in REST, we need a path to access this function in the URL. So we'll keep going. Uh, we could provide a description for this function. We see that it is using the workflow, add two numbers, which is what we have open currently. And then I have an execution mode option. And this, uh, unlike workflow action usage, is uh, very important for workflow functions that are called RESTfully. We are going to declare through this setting how this workflow is to be ran. So we have three choices. We have run in web server, which means that instead of running the workflow in the workflow engine, the workflow will actually be ran in the host service, which when called as a REST service will be our web server application. And in this case, the workflow will be ran very fast and the workload will be distributed out to the web server itself. So this is potentially the most efficient method or manner to execute these workflows which are being used as functions. Similar to run in web server, we have run in workflow engine not logged. And this means that, again, the workflow will be ran as fast as possible in process, not as a standard workflow, but in memory as fast as possible, and then discarded. And you, you will get some minimal basic information to troubleshoot workflows that run in the first two methods or two modes, but they are both distinct from the last, which is running workflow engine logged, which is the classic mode where the workflow will run directly from the workflow engine and I will have access to all of the information that I'm used to when I'm troubleshooting workflows such as my process diagram and my step details. So why would I pick run in engine logged over run in web server? Well, Remember that I said that when running in web server, the workflow is going to be ran in the host process, which will be the web application. And sometimes that host process does not have the resources that are necessary to fully execute the workflow that has been called. So we might have particular connectors or libraries that we need to use or resources that are not available or won't run in the desired manner when ran from a web service. Often though, those 
types of actions will run fine when ran from the workflow engine process instead. So that service has access to all of the resources that the full workflow engine has access to, all of the dependency libraries, network level resources, file resources, file shares. Uh, so often if a workflow function will not execute in web server mode, it will run just fine in engine not logged mode, but almost as fast as it will when ran in the web server mode. So you have these three options available, kind of super fast, perhaps some restrictions, super fast with probably no restrictions, and then your classic mode uh, engine logged, which will give you the full debugging and troubleshooting that is very useful to use while you're building out workflows initially. Our output type is important for this workflow function because it declares how this workflow should return its data when it's done. And in this case, we can specify variable, which means that this workflow function will be expected to set some variables and return the outputs in the variables, or it will return a simple string using a special action that can set that output for us, or it potentially returns a table, which would give us a tabular result. When called as a function, all three of these are valid options. That's a design time consideration that you'll need to make when running your function. But we'll start with the most basic, just picking variable. And if not the most basic, it's at least just the first. And so we'll continue on. So run as user uh, does not apply when we're calling this workflow restfully. It will be ran as the calling process. I'm going to pick again, run in web server so that this will run as quickly as possible. Output type will be variable. Then just as we had declared earlier, this function is going to take two inputs in number A and number B and provide some output in the result variable. And then further down, we have request body, which allows us to say, when called as a rest function, do we want to store any of the inbound rest calls body message into a target variable and we're not doing that in this case but that is extremely useful in the rest model and is very common when being used for webhooks we might do a separate video on how to support webhook calls using request body but for this example we're simply going to continue on and we don't care about the request body we've already declared that we want to use these inputs and this output. And similar to request body is query string. When being called restfully, we might want to store all of the URL or URI that was submitted for the request call into yet another variable for processing. But we are going to stick with our input and output in this case and continue on. One more consideration when we're creating a workflow that's intended to be called as a function via REST, we need to potentially set permissions for the call. We'll go ahead and add a row, and we have some options, some configuration parameters to choose from. User ID means that we could potentially restrict this workflow to a specific user, but we'll leave it open. Let's design this to be called more programmatically from another system. And instead of a user ID, which would need to authenticate when calling the service, we'll leverage our API key method. And we have a nice auto-generated GUID, which is a global unique number that we can pass in from our calling application or whatever test tools we want to use when calling RESTfully into this function that will be considered as authenticated. And I could set a date time to expire this function. So if I wanted to ensure that the function wasn't being called past a certain time, I could set a limiter on this function. 
I have everything I need now to test this workflow function restfully. So I'll go ahead and save my settings. And now I am done. I could, if I had all of the required access information, go ahead and start making calls to this workflow. PMG provides this workflow API endpoints interface, which gives us a self-service browser to explore any defined workflow functions that are accessible restfully and provide some lightweight documentation so that as the end user, I can understand what is needed when submitting this call. We are given the path as the name, as slash add two numbers, which we just declared in our manager screen. And we're provided input samples. In this case, a JSON document, which contains number A and number B to be set. And an output sample, which shows in this case that we are going to get a JSON document back that includes the result variable. I have then a token option where I can specify the token that we just had in our prior interface and I'm actually going to have to go back and copy and paste that in and number A and number B. So token is a magic input field that this web test interface provides that simulates passing the security token in which was the GUID that we just saw. We can toggle back to our workflow management screen and look at the add two numbers workflow function that we declared and grab the API key. Once we've copied our API key, we can toggle back to workflow API endpoints and paste that key directly into token. Then choose some number, let's say 25 and 45 and go ahead and click execute and we get a result very quickly. So what has happened is this test interface has executed restfully this particular workflow API endpoint. We have everything that we need to validate this workflow and ensure that it is online and available and can be called restfully. From here, we might want to try this API call using either some code or a command line tool, perhaps PowerShell or curl, if I'm familiar with that command line utility. Uh, Postman is a very popular tool that's built on Chrome that allows a developer or a tester to interact with REST calls, and this interface, the Workflow API Endpoints interface, will actually generate for us a Postman document. So if I click Export Postman, I have all of that information in a JSON document. So from here, we can go to Postman. And we can go ahead and import from raw text this project. If you are interested, you can browse through this document and see the details. So I've imported this project, Workflow API, into Postman. And I see that it is added at the bottom of my list of collections and I have the ability to go ahead and interact with my web service we see that the authorization header has been pre-populated with the key that was generated from the web interface and we have the ability to go ahead and make some changes to number A, let's say 50 and 60, 
and go ahead and hit send. And we get an immediate result of 110. We've successfully declared a workflow function as a REST API and called it interactively.